Greetings, humans. You have entered the Command Zone, your destination for all aspects of Elder Dragon Highlander. Enjoy your stay. What's up, everybody? You are watching slash listening to the Command Zone podcast. I'm one of your hosts today, Jimmy Wong, joined by... And I'm Craig Blanchett, Mr. Infect, here to fill in for Josh today. Does it ever uh, occur to you that maybe someday in the future you don't want to be known as Mr. Infect? It has occurred to me, but I do embrace it lovingly. I do love all of your Phyrexian stories, so please keep sharing them. <laughs> and good luck running for office as well, Craig. All right. <laughs> Today, Craig and I decided to do a very special, fun episode. We are talking about why do we keep losing Commander games? Because we're kind of the two players, I think, in the Command Zone office and on the internet that have lost the games in spectacular fashion, oftentimes yeah, I've, embarrassing. I've never won an episode of uh, Game Nights. Not on camera. We've Not, recorded uh, ones, but we have one. That's true. Yeah. This is true. Yeah, yeah. How about extra turns? I have one extra turns. Thank goodness. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Thank goodness. You've been on a lot of episodes. <laughs> I know. That'd be awful. Yeah, it would be. So we're going to go over ways to increase your win percentage, as well as asking yourself the hard questions as to why you're actually losing the games you play. But before we do, we got to talk about our sponsors. First, up channelfireball.com slash command they are new sponsors for the show very excitingly they're doing something called a box break and not just any box break they're doing an alpha box break of two starter packs starter decks from alpha magic of the gathering alpha set the original set from a trusted source That's ridiculous it's ridiculous That's so do you one want to of explain the coolest things i've ever I've, like honestly i've loved magic sense alpha and so yeah. that's honestly one of the coolest things yeah it's 999 bucks for 120 spots they have two alpha starter decks one's in the box with the cellophane wrapped over it so we don't know what's inside that one the other one is just the cellophane doesn't have the box and so we can see the card and it's mana short so how it works is you pay 999 dollars to get one of the 120 slots and when they open them you will get one card at random from those 120 it could be one of the big big baller cards from the set it could also be something smaller but that's sort of the sort of the fun of a box break well it also comes graded too and a lot of those graded cards are over a thousand dollars even commons and uncommons so yeah. yeah there's there's definitely value to this and excitingly proceeds from this are going to go to a charity nonprofit called acres of diamonds to help homeless moms and kids stay safe and especially with the holidays coming up this seems like a very valid and very relevant nonprofit. so it's great to see that channel fireball is doing something for the community for the proceeds of this event yeah that is cool all right, and of course, if you're not in for that box break, then you might just want to buy some cards. You can still do so at channelfireball.com slash command or just put in the code command at checkout. You may buy some cards for gifts for your friends. You got to do so quickly because those holidays are coming right up or maybe a New Year's present, right? Start the new year off. New year, new me, playing more broken, busted cards. They have a lot of infect cards. <laughs> channelfireball.com slash command for all your infect and regular magic needs. Our other sponsor for the show is Ultra Pro. Big shout out as always. They do all of the awesome playmats that you see on the show the dice the deck box the sleeves josh and i craig all of us we've trusted ultra pro for a very long time they're the ones that pioneered the original sort of like very commonly seen plastic top loaders that you would keep your valuable cards in what we all used to store commanders in back in the day too I, they were they've been in the game for the longest out of anybody they started making them for you know collectible baseball cards which mm -hmm. kind of led to magic in a way so pretty exciting yeah and finally you can support the show directly at patreon.com slash command zone or command patreon.com slash command <laughs> we shout out one lucky patron every single episode so this week's episode is dedicated to gerald chancy chancy it's spelled differently though all right let's go right into the main Wait, topic what? gerald gerald oh my god you rock man gerald you rock without josh here sometimes i forget that we need to tell them that they rock and gerald trust me you definitely rock. You rock. Everybody rocks, but Gerald rocks hardest. It rocks super hard. Yeah. This is the time, man. Gerald has been going nuts rocking out for the holiday season. All right. Main topic. Why do I, or in this case we, keep losing commander games? Now, everyone out there has been there. If you're the one commander player that's only won games in their entire lives, congratulations. But for everyone else, you lose most of the games. Uh, yeah, you should be losing 75% of the time. Right. In the four-player game, if you're if all things being equal, that should be about your regular loss rate. And if you're in that slump, if you've been on that losing streak, this episode is going to give you some things to consider, sort of break you out of that mold. And uh, again, Craig and I, I think, 
we'll bring up some episodes of game nights and extra turns moments where we either won really hard or lost really hard and talk about some of those reasons why but we thought we'd be the two most qualified people in the office to talk about this yeah we definitely have actual examples which is good yeah <laughs> now before we get into more nuanced discussions relating to how we play and how that makes us lose or win let's ask two fundamental questions and the first one is is my deck built to win so this is a core question, and it's a situation that you always put yourself at the commander table the moment you take your deck out. Your deck, we need to know, and you need to know, what is the actual purpose of your deck? Is your deck something specifically built to try and win? Or is it a, a deck that's sort of like, have fun with some win cons that are baked into it? So we're gonna do a quick breakdown of the differences. So Craig, let's start things off with my deck wants to win versus my deck can win. Yeah, there's a big difference there. You know, my deck wants to win is typically associated with CEDH because that's the whole purpose. Or You're, more competitive, not necessarily full CEDH, but definitely on the more competitive side. Absolutely. You you build this deck to win as often as possible versus, you know, how I think you and I build most of our decks. Actually, which I think is, this is how most people are yeah, trending I think towards so in general. I would say most decks are more like this than the other kinds. Right. Is your deck can can win. And that basically means that you build it as synergistically as you want, but it's not built to win. You're built to do a thing as, you know, up to the level that you're looking for. But right. there's, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not built in yeah. a way that turn three turn four this right. is the combo i play these three things and i win the game on the spot it's trying to do this it has tutors to do this it has redundancies to do this that is a deck that wants to win versus a deck that can win so when it comes to cdh like we just mentioned they're by definition competitive that means it has the goal specifically of winning and beating the opponents and it's competitive by nature so those are definitely in the want to win category and usually you can tell a duck wa a deck wants to win because it has a combo that is unstoppable or if it goes through the game is over uh, and the other thing we talked about is trying to do a thing it sounds like very very vague and sort of even ominous a little bit but you're trying to do a thing in the deck could be i want to play cards that have hats on them or i want to make everyone force combat into one direction or to go to everyone all i mean the time. it could even be in like a edgar markov deck i want to make as many vampires as possible right you know and it this i want to do this thing can be super competitive and it can also be kind of like i play a lot of cards with hats on them and things yeah, of that yeah. nature and there are like you said right like because obviously vampires making a ton of them is going to win the game but that might not be the focus of the deck right if that if your deck wanted to win then it'd be i want to make a bunch of vampires i want to board wipe before that happens or i want to do one side of board wipes and right like you have a combo of things that you the play pattern to get you to win um oftentimes though the decks that are just trying to do a thing are like thematic it could be cute too it could be like i want to make my opponents draw as many cards as possible i want to give them gifts and make them take control of other people's permanents at the same time i also have a triumph of the hordes in my deck because what typically ends up happening is by turn eight or nine i've stolen enough creatures things have gone chaotically enough that i can definitely win the game with one of these win cons but that's not what i'm trying to do from the get-go that's not like the the one line pitch of the deck if you were going sounded to sounded like my type of deck I like yeah that. exactly <laughs> all right and then the second big question outside of of, uh, is your deck built to win is am I trying to win now the question might seem a little blithe because I think a lot of you out there might be like well of you're course I'm trying, trying to win, win. Yeah. but I think it's a little different because when you're playing competitively it's competitive playing is not synonymous with general commander play with good reason because a lot of people like Craig and I love the format because it's casual because it's fun because we make crazy things happen and not everyone necessarily sitting down at the table if right if they had a hierarchy of needs the number one need might not be i want to win it might be instead i want to infect the table with as much as possible or, or have fun craig have I was gonna fun say, have sure fun. that's my way of having fun Jimmy. there you go but it doesn't necessarily mean you win right no, absolutely, absolutely not. I could have fun just by doing this big play that I wanted to do, by playing a new card, you know, by doing an interaction that I've done before, but in a bigger way than I've ever done it before. Right. Striking know, a really interesting deal for the first time, getting yep. back at someone for an older game or something in those worlds, right? Right. Yeah, so I think Commander is often closer to a board game night than like a competitive uh, PTQ or something of that nature, because it's more about the gathering than actually the like, oh, right, like when you're 
done playing Commander at the night. We don't stand up and say, like, congratulations, everyone. Craig won the most games tonight, and thus he wins the game night. It's like, right. no, everyone leaves and goes, wow, that was so fun. I had a great time when you did this, when that happened, blah, 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 blah. Wow, I had no, that, uh, no idea that card could do X, Y, and Z. So those are the things that we take away from Commander Nights in general. But when you ask the question, am I trying to win... There are a couple of uh, sort of nuances to that as well, which is, does winning affect my fun level? Right. So, Craig, are you someone that loves to win because if you win, you're having more fun, or does that not matter to you as much? No, I'm the type of person, and this this comes down to personality, I think, more than anything else. You know, I enjoy the aspect, the social aspect of the game. I love, mm -hmm. you know, getting together with my friends and just kind of joking the whole time. You know, if you ever get in a game with me, you'll notice that I'm usually joking a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, and it's a way to, you know, I like the table banter. I like to talk about things outside of the game while we're playing. Cause you know, most of the people that I play with uh, know what the, these cards do and things like right. that. So for me, it's more about a way to connect with people. Yeah. So it's almost like being at the table is a good reason to talk and social and play commander on top commander isn't exactly. the sole focus for you exactly for me it's a vehicle to connections yeah and so you know i'll play spicy things you know to do to get table reactions and things of that nature and i'll also you know i'll try to win right but if i you know you know is will winning affect my fun level i would say no because oftentimes i will see somebody else that you know the, I, not that I would like Kingmaker or anything like that, but like, you know, in, in you know, in one game that I had recently, uh, you know, someone knew that I would say yes to their, uh, what is it, fact or fiction. Right. And so I said yes to their fact of fiction. And somebody else got very upset because it was like, why would you do this? This is so they're already ahead. <laughs> but, you know, it's part of the fun of, you How, know, playing you like for them. me. Right. Exactly. Right, right, right. And yeah. so, you know, I think for me, uh, winning absolutely does not affect my fun level. Like, it's always fun to win. You're always like, oh, that's cool. Right. But, you know, when you're on camera, like, you know, we're also kind of often gone after. We're also often, like, immediately arch enemy. So <laughs> winning, winning sometimes puts a target on my head, which, you know... In other games, can, right, can right. affect the future, which we'll get into. And something that you should also keep in mind too, if you're trying to figure out if winning is is a legitimate like top tier thing for you to have fun, is ask yourself in other games, did you play like Smash Brothers, Call of Duty, yeah. or competitive Fortnite? Magic? Yeah, or competitive anything? Or, yeah. yeah, are you are do the in those games right? Are you affected by the winning a lot, or do you not care? Um, Craig, did you ever play other video games that you can relate to, you think, for Magic? I did, but I've always been horrible at them, you know? Ah, and so, you know, I was always more of a chess, like, Final Fantasy I liked because I could take time kind of planning my stuff out. And uh -huh. so those, you know, Types reflex games. type games, I wasn't very good at. And so I kind of, you know, when you're not good at something, you kind of lean away from it. So yeah, yeah. So I Magic never makes got perfect sense for you then. Exactly. And Especially also, Commander. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I would say your answer reflects how you played other games before and whether or not winning like seriously affects your fun level. Absolutely. Which is why I said originally, I think it's more to your core personality and knowing yourself is part of knowing how to play. Yeah. And the other question on the other side of this, if the first question is, does winning affect my fun level is does losing affect my fun level? And weird this is, how similar, but different they are. Yeah. Very different. Um, because I, I think like asking yourself if losing makes you feel quote unquote bad can help you understand the relationship that you have to winning as well. So, cause, cause some people may never care to win, but they also might be the kind of person that hates to lose yep. right there they'd much rather be second place than fourth place or whatever or maybe there's a variation of the two that they don't care so much about winning and they don't care so much about losing whatever it is there's definitely going to be a lot of nuance for every single person and i would say again look to moments in your life or events like maybe when you went go-karting with your friends or you played basketball in high school or you were in debate club and the type of event might not might might change it too right a magic game may mean way less to you but you know, when you play that soccer game and you miss the penalty shot that lost you the game, that could have been way different. It was a team effort or whatever. So that's also really interesting to think like if it's a solo adventure, because a lot of times magic is just you versus the table. That kind of winning is different than team winning and that kind of losing is different than team losing as well. So ask yourself, 
real honestly, if losing affects your fund level and if winning affects your fund level, and then I think you'll get a good gauge of how you view yourself in relationship to winning the game. And then that's going to help you inform how you move and play the game from there. Yeah. And we'll definitely get into different aspects of, you know, if you think that winning or losing does affect your fund level, there are things that we're going to mention that are things to consider to kind of, you know, we could all use a different perspective check every once in a while. So I think that's what the rest of it's going to be. Yep. And Craig, uh, you are someone that specifically said you like to make memories more than anything else. I do play the game. So that has nothing to do with winning or losing, by the way. And that's a really important thing that Craig knows about himself. That makes him keep having fun when he plays. Yep. Okay. Now we've got those two core questions out of the way. Let's talk about Commander and why the heck we keep losing in it. Um, So here are a bunch of reasons now, and we'll break down each of them as we go through them, why you might be losing in Commander. The first one up is, I'm losing because of the level that I play Commander. So Commander is a pretty dense format, right, Greg? Oh, hugely dense, yeah. The power levels can range from really casual to complex completely no holds barred competitive and i'd say when you go to an lgs you get a good look at sometimes i mean it depends on the lgs as well but you typically get a good look at what the more competitive side can be because there are people that go there to play tournaments and there's also people that go there to play casually but because the competitive events are there you do have more competitive play groups and i think you've seen this at some of the local stores around here right yeah, and LA has a more competitive scene than a lot of other places and also, you know, a lot more LGSs in a small area than a mm-hmm. lot of other places. But LGSs definitely tend to be a place where you see a large variance of play levels. You know, you will most uh, most LGSs will have somebody there who is, you know, playing at the highest level and then somebody who is new to the game and was just brought into you know because their friend was like hey you should come over here and hang out Mm -hmm. so you know the the variance in that can can be pretty great and that can definitely have an effect on the game if you're playing at a level that's not matching the rest of the table yeah uh, and either side of that equation and sometimes you don't even know until you're into it uh or people don't do a good enough job explaining or you're just not at a high enough level to yourself to understand oh wait a minute i actually shouldn't play with this group because it's not going to be a pleasurable experience and i'm definitely going to keep losing um, I'm definitely seeing that meme of the like everything's fine with everything's the fire. Fine. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, <And> yeah <laughs> I've been, definitely been there before where i'm like this this deck is not up to speed. yeah you have a casual commander in the fire is burning with like Moldrotha <laughs> and Corvold and Chulane and all those decks. Oh, um, God, that sounds awful. Yeah. But the level you play commander does make a big difference. So if you're still new to the game and you've just joined the format, maybe you've watched game nights and you decide to start playing, sitting on the table can be really intimidating. So like keeping track of a bunch of board states is one of the hardest things to do. And it's still something that we mess up all the time. Like all the time. Oh, every, yeah. Almost every game. Cards somebody, you don't know. Somebody is making a mistake. Yeah. Uh, there's never, I'll say this, there's never been a perfect game of Commander played where everyone played absolutely perfectly, made every perfect decision just because there's so many steps and instances along the way where something could go wrong or you make a mistake without even realizing it. So I think like the takeaway from that, if you're losing because of your level, is don't be hard on yourself. These opportunities are learning moments. Um, figure out or, you know, you, you brought up a great thing, which is just like ask questions. Yeah, absolutely. So many people are open to like, you know, and this happens at every level. Can I see that card? Man, they've been printing a lot of cards this year. Mm-hmm. Can I Can I read that, please? Can I see what's going yeah. on there? How does that actually work? And you'll find that most players, for, I, at least from what I can tell, will be happy to explain right. the And if not that person, the person next, next to them, to them will yeah. be like... <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no, you got to oh, watch yeah. out. Yeah, 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 they yeah, left yeah. out this key detail or something. Yeah. yeah, but don't be hard on yourself. I mean, experienced players all the time make mistakes. We saw it happening just as recently as the Mythic Championship that just happened for... Uh, standard and stuff uh on game nights episode four i had a price of glory on the battlefield which does not like it when you tap lands that when it's not your turn they blows them up and i tapped out almost all of my lands after playing the card that specifically did that so i made a massive mistake and i consider myself at a somewhat higher level so you can't feel bad about those moments let them be teaching moments so that you don't sort of get crushed by your own errors (laughs) here's one thing memory was created I remember that moment very well. I wasn't in that game, but I have watched that game, and I remember that moment. (laughs) Yep. Wes, Wes, Wesley Rutherford, who was there, just looked at me and go, uh, um, and I, with a big smile, went, what? And yeah, big, big mistake there. 
Um, so the next thing to talk about, what we just mentioned, is just asking the right questions. Yeah. And I think one thing people don't realize is that a good question can also be a political play. Um, and it can even be from a place where you're not trying to politic. There have been so many times where a new player goes like, wait, wait, I, there's so much going on. What's the biggest threat at the table right now? And loaded everyone question. chimes loaded in. Question. Even if the player doesn't know how much of a loaded question that is, everyone's like, well, I have an opinion. It's certainly nothing on my board. Yeah, welcome to table politics. Like, but like, that's like a great question to ask if you're at a lower power level or if you're at a lower skill true. level or just don't know what's going on because one, it's a genuine question. You're not doing it to be malicious or evil and it's going to give you so much information as so well as perspective for teach the future. You. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and also like the right question at the right time, once you sort of get better into it can really turn the shape of a game upside down. So the example I have here is at the end of game nights, Theros beyond death, uh, Josh is just dominating with an Uro deck and I'm barely clinging on, but I ask him right before, uh, I take my turn when he has no other ability to do anything and it's about to be my full control. How many cards are left in your library? And for those of you that don't remember, I milled Josh out with an Ultra of Dementia in that game because of that question. But I couldn't ask that question any earlier because it had to be in like the beginning of his turn and I asked him that question. He might go, why did you ask that? Oh, you know what? I'm going to do something to make sure I don't get milled out this turn or whatever it is. So asking the right questions can be really important. So. And to your point there, asking the right, que right questions at the right time. You'll yes. learn as you, you know, because we're talking about you just got into magic. As you become a more attuned and a better pilot of these decks, you'll learn that timing is everything. Everything, yeah. And you may not get there at first, but just asking questions of what does that card do again? Can someone explain to me how the commander works with that or why we should be afraid? Trust me, commander players, if there's anything we like to do, it's feel smart about the things we're doing and playing and explain things to other people. So I think you'll find that those questions are great and they will help you develop your gameplay too. And that leads kind of perfectly into the next point, which is know your deck. Yeah. Like you really need to, the best, the better you know your deck, the more you're going to increase your win percentage because right. you're going to know when do these cards work? When is the optimal time to use these cards? What card am I searching for? right now ah, you yeah. know what what can my deck do at what times if the more you know that your deck the better you're going to play magic and there's a lot of times when i'm looking at my hand and i'm like ah there's too much going on i have drawn six cards this turn uh i'm just gonna just do this in past turn and then 10 seconds later i go oh mom why didn't i i knew that this this was in my hand i could have done this and that i know how this works but i didn't piece it together and so and that's that leads huge. into two kind of because if you you could then be like oh can i take that back which you know <laughs> now you're affecting but also you know you could also be not as generous to curry up your hand and you could sit there for 15 minutes mm, maybe i could mm, but maybe mm -hmm. this and you'll find out pretty quickly that'll increase the salt level for your next game and may make you the target for next <laughs> game so yeah knowing what you're doing and knowing the cards in your deck is a very easy and also way that you can do this yourself you don't need other players to look through your deck and understand the interactions you can just sort of do that by yourself so if you find that you're in those positions where you've drawn a bunch of cards or you just don't know what the right play is then a way that you can lose a little less maybe is learning how those interactions work and understanding how to do it one famous example of this is in the post malone episode i just built the deck the, the night before for as miranda martica diced in a cold car nice and i had a garner the blood flame combo that everyone in the comments was saying jimmy you could have done this you could have gone infinite well Oh, he's definitely faking it. And no, I just didn't know how that worked. I didn't know you could hold that priority in that way. And that's a fault for me, right? I, if I had known that, I wouldn't have lost that game. So that's just like a really easy, small thing for me to do prior. If you have a deck that you're building and you've been working on it, just look at the cards. Make sure you know what the cards do. Make sure you know if there's certain combos in there that you want to ha make happen, how to make them happen. Or if someone's trying to do something, you're like, you know what? I have to be able to have an instant speed answer up when these things scenarios are happening so you know that you have to hold that back and you know you have to have that instant card in your hand or whatever it is so that's just knowing your deck will help you better at and the game. even on top of that the the speed at which you'll play will in, will improve your relationships with the rest of the people <laughs> at the table which will it, really knowing your deck works on so many different levels yeah um and then the final sub point for i'm losing the game because of the level i play commander sometimes people like to associate this with oh i just don't have access to the higher priced cards I can't play that guy's cradle. Thus, that's the reason I lost the game. 
And this was a point you made, Craig, which is, look, if you're on the fence about something or you can't afford something, but you may want to get in the future and you're like, I can't even play it. You can make a test card. We do this all the time in Commander. Play test cards. You can scribble on another card and let the players know, hey, I'm testing out this to my deck to see if it really makes a difference. Yeah, when I was getting into the game, I would do this a lot. I would, you know, ask, I would rule zero it with my play play group. Hey, guys, you know, I'm looking to spend some money on, you know, Vorin Clex and or whatever. (laughs) Well, jeez. Well, well, jeez. I was, okay, fine. Vorin Clex. You know, back then it was actually like Primeval Titan or something like that. Yeah, yeah. of course, Banner. And so, you know, I was like, you know, I'm looking to put this in. So I think I probably had to proxy the Urborg and stuff because they were pretty pricey back then but, oh right right you know i'm i'm uh you know do you guys mind and most people especially if they're up to that power level already are okay with that one note that i would say is like don't do this to a level where you're outpowering other people yeah don't show up with like 50 cards all proxied and it's well, time twister yeah, guys cradle you know right. all that stuff cards that are like legal but they're like you know Impossible three thousand dollars yeah, yeah right <laughs> Um, you know, I've definitely seen that before. And uh, while I don't mind playing against a deck like that, because look, you do you like, I'll cool. I'll play against it. You know, like I've played against post Malone. I've played against, you know, <laughs> uh, Cassius Marsh. I've seen it before. Kyle Hill. I've seen that before. Right. Uh, but, uh, yeah, you know, don't overdo it. I would say exactly. Just be careful. Um, but again, don't also blame, it's tough because you might go, I'm not winning because I don't have the expensive cards, but there could be a whole multitude of factors. So help get rid of one of those factors by adding in those playtest cards to see if they actually do make a big difference. And if they do, then you can make an informed decision. Okay, do I go for a budget version of this card? For instance, right. like uh, Cradle Vitlamok, instead of trying to get a guy's cradle. And is that going to make a huge difference? Or even Circle of Dreams Druid. Now, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, like totally. Much easier way to get it done. Yeah. All right, so that is I'm losing because of the level I play commander. Next up we have I'm losing because of politics. Dun, dun, (laughs) dun. 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 Yeah, so it turns out politics is a big reason why we win slash lose games, or at least it it adds to the eventual sort of tally as to how close I am to winning or how close I am to losing. Because technically, politics is a limitless value engine. Yeah, it's it's impossible to calculate the weight that politics will play in a game. Basically. Yeah, in any yeah. game. Sometimes it could be absolutely nothing. The players don't care about it at all. Sometimes it could be what the game is completely based around as well. Yep. Um, and if you use politics to the max, you could get way more value than just drawing a card off the top, right? Because you could be playing a card out of someone else's hand with the right politicking. And that is not really an effect that you can do in Magic. So politics really has just this, this expansive, incredible potential to make your games completely different um, by doing it smartly and deviously sometimes right but it's a double-edged sword i think the more i play with people like josh for instance the more people play and see us play on game nights they go wait a minute i know what you're doing here and then they'll just shut it down so it's definitely one of those things where if you use right can be an incredible tool but if you're also not using it right could be the reason that you're losing the game so the first point with i'm losing because of politics is know thyself and know thy play group so how political would you say our play groups are here at the command zone, Craig? Uh, because of Josh, the there is always <laughs> Because of Josh, le- and me too, man. I'm pretty political. Le- yeah, that's true. There's always a level of politics at the games. You know, there's always a, well, who's who's the most, you know, threatening right now? Who's, you know, even when we're playing Lunch Mander, it's like somebody will come over and be like, oh, man, that board state looks pretty crazy. And then everybody's <laughs> like, wait a second. What? Hey, don't give me your outside yeah, opinion. And, and right that's now. another, you know, you don't need to be a part of the table to affect table politics either. But yeah. uh, I would say to politics are, are prevalent in almost every game here yeah that's why one of my favorite ways to get better at politics is to not focus so much on the ooh, if i make this deal to do this then this is going to happen but just doing what i like to call common sense politics if something is common sense looking at it a problem then it shouldn't be too hard for other players to agree with you. If Craig has a Vorinclex and a Jin Cataxius out, it shouldn't be a hard thing to convince someone, especially if it's a newer player that maybe is going to affect, right? Let's say... They want to be complete, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Craig. But let's say we're at a four-player table and two of the players are relatively new. And I want to make sure that we all have a chance to win the game. But more importantly, if those two players don't understand what the real threat is at the table, just because they're new, no fault to them, then that actually reduces my chances quite a bit because that right. means that you might spiral out of control. Yeah. So if you have that Vorn Clex and Jin Cataxius out and we're like, the only thing that's going to stop this is a board wipe, player three, who's very new to the game, might be thinking, oh, I should be saving my board wipe for when I'm going to lose the game. Yep. So the common sense thing would go, if anyone has any removal, it is very necessary to get rid of these things as soon as possible 
possible because of X, Y, and Z or whatever it is. It's a very common sense thing to say. No one's going to be thinking you're manipulating them, but it's going to give a cue to maybe the newer players to do something that will help you and everyone else out. And thus through politicking, you can lose a little bit less to do that. Don't let Craig get nuts. Um, <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> so think about it, right? You're affecting my next games, Jimmy. In every single game, there's going to be some common sense or duh moments. And those are always okay, I think, to put out in the open if people aren't noticing it. Or if some you see someone sandbagging a removal for something else, but it's like, no, 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 we actually need you. And maybe you can give them some tangible benefit. I'll help you draw some cards. I won't attack you, whatever it is, just to make sure that those things end up happening. Yeah, I think you're touching on two small... You know, things that uh, deals can be deceptive. You can be short sighted in your deals. I've seen it a lot where people are like, well, if you don't do this, then I won't do that. Yeah. And, you know, it gets around a turn later and they're like, wait a minute. I, that's right. I agreed or not disagreed to do this. And now they've got their foot in their mouth. Mm -hmm. You know, at the same time, you can, you know, make deals that can hurt you in a way that's like, let's say you were like, oh man, that, you know, that, uh, uh, grave pact is a problem you should mm -hmm. that grave pact is a big problem and you're playing a tokens deck and i'm playing a spells deck ah, yes. that that grave pact is not a problem for me but you know you may be influencing me and hyping me up to be like yeah that is, is a, problem. a problem right yeah i do have a commander and now it's going to be gone when it's like i have all these instants and sorceries in my deck I'll so be fine yeah, yeah. I, I think in those cases it's not a bad thing to be honest too and i found that i do this all the time where if i'm that token deck and the grave pact is out but i know it's going to be a problem problem because it's going to affect two other players and then we're not going to be able to team up if that person becomes our enemy or whatever i can say like hey i'm pretty safe against that grave pact i personally have no reason to remove it but you both have a lot of reason to right and if you don't this could turn bad for everyone else i think that's a great way to get around it too is don't try and hide what the truth is especially if other players are smart enough to suss out what's going on in your deck or counterpoint you sometimes just putting the truth out there and being honest like look i don't need to remove it but i'm recommending everyone else does up to you if you want to but i'm just saying if things spiral out of control and that's still there you are all going to be feeling the effects of it way more than me, and thus we should work together to do it. So that's a good way where common sense and honesty can really help politicking turn into something that's actually beneficial for the group. Because at the end of the day, a lot of times games come down to two of us need a team up to take this out, three of us need a team up to take that out, otherwise we all lose the game. Yeah. Um, and don't forget, sugar, not salt, is the next sub point of losing because of politics. Trust Craig on this one. When you're playing cards that make other people salty, uh, like the Vorinclexes, the Phyrexians, any amount of Infect, players are going to remember, and they are going to change the way that they play against you in the future. So if you keep losing because of that political situation where someone gets sit down at the table and goes, oh, it's Craig? We got to get rid of him. I don't have any early blockers. And if he's playing Infect, it's just over for me. So you can become the implied arch enemy in future games based on your reputation and what you bring to the table politically. Yeah, 100%. So don't do that. And this happened in Game Nights 14 when you did play Vorinclex. I did. I did. What happened there, Craig? So in Game Nights 14, I so I played Vorinclex and I announced that I was playing Vorinclex and then Mel Mel's response kind of tells it all. She <laughs> <laughs> you know, she basically goes into how, you know, awful it is and how who plays Vorinclex? Vorinclex is a card for jerks. She's not wrong. <laughs> um, they did just reprint it though. And in a better version. So, but that's a great way of, of right. Like Mel by saying something that's true to her and a lot of people can agree with it turns Craig into maybe more of an arch enemy than he actually deserved to be. So if Craig's actual threat level was like 50, 60%. Oh, for years, I'll still get that's a jerk <laughs> card for jerks every once in nice. a while. So. Yeah, so your threat level, right, automatically jumps another 15, 20%, even yep. though it's just implied and not actually based on the cards yep. on the table. So be careful uh, with your gameplay because if the more sugar you pour onto the, the things, it'll make it more sweet and the more salt, well, people will get more salty as well. Yep. Um, and finally, the real world can can creep into table politics. This is the last reason why you might be losing because of politics. And I would just say, try to avoid this at almost all costs. Um, taking your real world problems and venting or taking your frustrations out on other people in the scope of a game when everyone's trying to escape from those types of things or, or focus on something else for a bit can be really damaging to playgroups, can completely tear them apart. Um, I think you told a story a long time ago about one player that would always just just maliciously destroy everyone's lands over and over again and, and had no care about it in the real world either. The, the the person who taught me how to play magic was was like that and uh 
you know, I think that we've all seen people like this at certain times, you know, I think even a lot of players go through this at certain times. And it's one of those things where you kind of like learn not to do it by the, usually the play group being like, we, you know, having a conversation with you that Don't you're like, that. man, this, whatever. So I, yeah, I think people go through this at different times in their life, but, uh, it can be unpleasant to, you know, have somebody, you know, destroy you and then be like it's your fault it's like wait a minute Hold <laughs> yeah on. so make sure that you're always talking to your play group if you see these things start to arise try and nip it in the bud too i would recommend and obviously again every play group's different the way you talk to them is different as well some people may be more open to having the conversation than others but if you're not the person to do it then maybe there's someone else too just make sure that these things don't spiral out of control so that yeah. every time you sit down there's like an extra layer of ire anger resentment whatever it is because that's going to take away from the fun of the game and maybe the reason that you end up losing more because people sort of can't get that part of it out of their head just to enjoy the game for what it is yep and the quicker you nip those in the bud the better absolutely all right next up i'm losing because of play groups or matchups being uneven now we've all seen this and we've all probably been on either side of the equation for better or worse we have definitely craig and i have definitely been on both sides of this yep. um and i've been seeing a lot of this recently which is the rule zero conversation going awry so for those of you that don't know rule zero is make sure you discuss with your play group before the game starts what expectations should be what power levels are what people should be aware of or whatever it is to make sure that the game itself is as fun as possible because it would be like going to a racetrack and you have an f1 car craig has a old honda civic josh has a nice nissan z and then mel has a airplane and walking in and everyone goes oh yeah i'm at the same power level as you and then the race starts and everyone gets blown out of the water by whatever that is not a good real rule zero conversation and i've seen a lot of talk online about people saying you know what people keep saying have a rule zero conversation but they're not actually representing their decks correctly whoops has that happened? Oh, it happens all the time. I think it's also, you know, inadvertent. I, th I think it's not malicious. You know, certain things on this list are more malicious than others. But this is, I think, you know, it can be, but I think oftentimes is the least malicious out of all these things, but also the most prevalent because every time you're getting together with a new play group, you know, for a game, you're dealing with everybody's not only their power level as a player, but their power level as each commander that they're playing. Because and remember, deck, yeah. yeah, you're you're combining the player with the deck because uh, changing out the player has as much of an effect in most cases as changing out the, the deck and the commander. So, so yeah, it's a good yeah. point. It might be important for people now to add on to the rule zero conversation or just maybe take another look at how you're having it because you could factor in player skill or player experience if you don't want to use skill um and you could also maybe share more details like here is my win con here's when i expect to win the game here's how much fast mana i'm running in the deck because if you're the only player with grim monolith and mana crypt you're going to be an advantage over others so making sure that people understand oh okay you're at that power level i get it will make sure that the sort of game that you play into is going to be more balanced and even and you'll find yourself losing a little bit less as a result yeah we did an episode a, a while back that was a uh, we basically made the power level on a one to 10 scale based off of certain aspects. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's been noted that that's probably outdated. So I would imagine in 2022, we'll probably revamp that a little bit because there's a little bit of conversation about adding in uh, win cons and infinite combos and things like that, taking yeah, things like that into consideration. If your deck has a bunch of infinite combos, how many in it, tutors you have? Better, that's a part of the rule zero conversation. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of what people are doing um, is saying a little bit, but not enough because maybe they're afraid of telling too much about their deck. Sure. But in this case, I think oversharing for rule zero conversations moving forward might be safer because at the end of the day, you're playing a game for fun and hiding your win cons or whatever. I, that to me doesn't seem as important as just making sure everyone at the table has the best time as possible. Yep. And also some games just end up being blowouts, even yep. if the play groups are evenly matched. Um, one good episode from Game Nights that represents this is one where I won the Christmas episode in 2019. You were there too, Craig. I remember. I played your Send Triplets deck, by the yep. way. You built it. So I'm going to blame you. <laughs> <laughs> I take, I like kill Josh. I take over every single part of DJ's hand and his board. And 
it just demoralized everyone. And it wasn't like I was playing a deck that was significantly more powerful. It wasn't like I was even the best player at the table. I just happened to draw the right cards in the right order and just have the right things. And DJ also just happened to have a stacked hand for me to go through. So sometimes things are just blowouts. And I would say don't be so demoralized if you're losing a lot, if that sort of win happens, or if you're even the person that wins that way. These games are not necessarily the norm, but they do happen from time to time, and they're, they just do. Okay, we have a lot more to cover here. We're going to take a quick mid-roll break to hear from our sponsors, but when we come back, we're going to talk about being a little too cocky, going off too quickly, or just keeping really bad opening hands. So uh, stay tuned. We'll be right back with more ways that we're losing the game. Uh... Why does it look like Home Alone in here? I'm setting up a booby trap because we've got so many valuable magic cards in the house that we should protect them. Okay. This works how exactly? Right. So when the intruder comes in the door, it's gonna lift up this deck box, which is then gonna hit the wheel, and then this ball's gonna roll down, hit that candlestick, and then boom, the penguin in the bucket will drop, and then the- Jimmy, why don't we just use Simply Safe's wireless outdoor camera? That's what I have at home. Uh-oh. Am I about to look ridiculous? Well, Simply Safe is the best home security out there. They offer indoor and outdoor cameras and comprehensive sensors, all monitored 24 seven by trained professionals who send help the moment you need it. You can customize your system to cover your entire home in just minutes. And right now you can get 40% off with Simply Safe's holiday deals. With complete systems starting at just over $100 and no long-term contracts, it's never been easier to keep your home and your magic cards safe and secure. Okay, you're right. Simply Safe's outdoor camera system sounds like a much better security plan. Oh, hey, you want to help me clean this up? Nope. Take advantage of Simply Safe's holiday deals and get 40% off your new home security system by visiting simplysafe.com slash command. Again, that's simplysafe.com slash command for 40% off your entire system. Well met, we're Halana. And Alina, romantical partners. Every year, we face the age-old gift-giving problem. What do you get the skilled huntress who's capable of taking anything she wants from anyone? But if you're struggling to shop for the badass in your life, there's hope. Today, you can save big on a gift they'll use every day. Raycon wireless earbuds. We never hunt without them. Raycons feature amazing audio quality, but start at half the price of other premium brands. They have built-in mics that are perfect for phone calls or coordinating ambushes. And the new everyday earbuds feature three different sound programs. Files. To focus while aiming my bow, I use Pure Mode, the perfect setting for instrumental music. And when I'm hacking and slashing monsters to bits, I blast hard rock using Balanced Mode. With eight hours of playtime and a 32-hour battery life, Raycons last through the stakeout, hunt, and ensuing feast. Oh, nothing tastes better than meat you killed while grooving out! Woo! The holidays are coming up faster than you think. Now is the time to knock out that gift list and avoid the last minute shipping scramble. Especially because right now, fans of the Command Zone will get 15% off site-wide with the code HOLIDAY at buyraycon.com slash command. Go to buyraycon.com slash command and use code HOLIDAY today to get 15% off your entire Raycon order. Buyraycon.com slash command. Hey, do you want a candy cane? Yes, one second, I gotta prepare. Nah. Uh, are you doing mouth stretches? Yeah, this time of year is filled with candy and eggnog and sweets, so I gotta make sure my mouth is ready. I practice my stretches and do 40 tongue crunches a day. Tongue crunches? Does that mean my tongue could be as buff as my arms? Uh-huh. And most importantly, I practice good oral health care with my Equip electric toothbrush. It has timed sonic vibrations with 30-second pulses to make sure I always get a dentist-recommended two-minute clean. And beyond the brush, Quip provides fresh floss, toothpaste, mouthwash, and sugar-free gum. That's everything you need for a complete oral care routine delivered every three months starting at just $5. Plus, if you upgrade to the new smart motor, you can track and improve your brushing while earning reward points to use on free refills, Target gift cards, and more. Mmm. Oh man, this is a good cane. You want one? Well, what if I'm not ready? I gotta get Quip. But how? If you go to getquip.com slash command right now on top of their holiday savings, you'll get your first refill free. That's your first refill free and up to 40% off bundles at getquip.com slash command. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash command. Quip, the good habits company. All right, welcome back. We're talking about ways and why we keep losing commander games. This one's pretty simple. I'm losing because I kept a really bad opening hand or I'm just making bad decisions. Uh, I think we're both pretty bad at this, Craig. We both have made really bad keeps and really bad decisions that have left us sitting there wasting an hour of our time as we are stuck in a miserable state with zero mana or whatever it is and locked out. So yeah, when it happens, it sucks. You're just there with, you know, you're like you opening hand, you have three lands. You're like, this is great. You may, maybe even you have a signet or something like that, but then you just 
don't draw any more lands. <laughs> I mean, or, that's not keeping a bad hand. That's a good hand to keep. Yeah, but that's I will true. Say, that's true. Make sure that you talk to your play group and know what mulligan rule is in place. So if, you know, at the command zone, we don't care so much when people mulligan. We just want people to play a good game. Obviously, you're not supposed to sit there and take 10 mulligans in a row. But if you have to take a few, that's fine. We're not going to make you super penalized as a result. But some play groups, and especially in game stores, will be a little more strict about it. So make sure that is in place so that you can make an informed decision and don't feel as bad when you need to mulligan a hand that's maybe a riskier keep. Don't keep risky hands. Don't. Just don't do it. Unless you know your deck has so many ways out of it or your commander has card draw built into it. Um, another sub point is if you had to choose between card draw and ramp in your hand, Craig, in your opening hand, which would you go with? I would go with card draw. Yes. Every time. Why is that? Because you can always kind of draw into answers, but you can't necessarily ramp into answers. Yep. Yep. And a lot of times you might have that, oh, wow, I'm, I'm the Cassius Marsh turn three Ugin play. And exactly how that game played out is he turned three Ugand and it was gone and he didn't have that much gas as a result because he didn't have card draw in his hand. So if you have a choice and you're looking at a hand and it's got nothing but ramp in it, you might think, oh, this is a perfect, amazing hand. But once you dump all those cards out and you don't have a ways to draw cards back in your hand, you're just going to be stuck. And what, one more consideration with that too is that, you know, Cassius became arch enemy very quickly in that game True. because of That's that. Good point. That's you good know, point. he ramped up and then didn't have anything to back it up. So you can be setting yourself up to lose more games. Why do I keep losing? Because you keep ramping with nothing to back That's it up. Good point. And finally, don't forget to still be smart about your deck building i see a lot of new players they'll send me deck lists all the time on twitter and all that stuff and sometimes i'll click through sometimes i won't but when i do and i find it's a new player they've got 28 lands in their commander deck and that is my friend big feel bads not even close to good enough you need to be running 36 37 maybe even more depending on what your deck is doing look at your cmc look at your average cmc you know average numbers are somewhere between 34 and 37 depending on your ramp package and there's look there's so many episodes of not only our podcast but others that go over this exact thing mm -hmm. but yeah at least 34 you know there are people who say otherwise that you know you can go lower uh, look at their cmc i mean don't like, there's certain cdh don't that are it. going like 30 but they're like topping out at three cmc and they so. also have 20 mana rocks in their deck yeah or whatever exactly it is, so. know your deck yeah. know your deck don't forget to build smart a huge reason why a lot of games are lost and people go why do i keep losing games my deck is filled with powerful cards yeah but it might not have the right ratio of them to make sure that you have a consistent game every single time yep all right the next reason we're losing the game is i'm losing because i'm going off too quickly yep. and this is probably the thing that craig you're the most guilty of i would say of all of these that's why i just brought it up a minute ago yeah so arch enemy <laughs> it's a very real thing it, even though there is no rules that say you have to team up on the person that's doing the best it quite often happens to just be the natural thing that the table does and popping off like that crazy amount but then you don't seal the deal yeah could be disastrous and be a huge reason why you're still which losing. it could go either way i mean if you are ramping like crazy like that episode with Cassius or the one where I ramped out either way if you ramp out to have seven eight mana on turn three you know that is a way for you to then capitalize on that with say a Silvala Stampede or a good card or something like that right something that lets you then use that mana to, to mm -hmm. flush out your board but if you ramp really fast and you have nothing left you put a huge target on your head so I, I do think that it's a little bit different from Arch Enemy but very similar like to become Arch Enemy true Arch Enemy you have to ramp fast and then back it up with some sort of big haymaker whereas ramping fast doesn't necessarily make you the arch enemy but your opponents don't know that you're not arch enemy right. so you're you could be setting yourself up for fa failure by ramping too fast which yeah, just dumping out your hand i actually have a great example of this in the most recent extra turns you know you asked me you sandbag that uh, that mana crypt yeah and i and i <laughs> kind of coyly go no I absolutely sandbagged that mana crypt uh -huh. because I didn't want to come off too fast. And then all of a sudden, everybody's looking at me. Nobody had really developed that much. Right. And the best part of that game, towards the end, you know, you'll see if I had done that mana crypt early. You might have died earlier, I, too. You know, that the game end would have ended differently, probably. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so knowing, right, if you're, if you're the person that's known to go off really quickly and you play a mana crypt turn one, even if you're just you know doing a couple small things with it people might go oh they're, they're off to it again they're gonna let's team up yep. and get rid of them or just hit them with that board wipe immediately yeah so sometimes sandbagging yourself can be a way to fight against that sort of i'm going off too quickly and everyone's putting an immediate target on my back might feel good in the moment but not going to feel so good when 
everyone's targeted you and taken out your stuff and then you're completely behind the rest of the table for the rest of the well, game well it's an odd thing too because we're talking about you know how to win more how why do i keep losing mm -hmm. it's an odd thing to say okay i'm gonna hold back and then wait with my ramp package until other people have developed and we've seen this happen a lot of times where the fourth the person perceived in fourth place will end up winning because people are like ah I don't want to destroy their stuff. They're still kind Let of catching chill, yeah. up. Exactly. So you can still hold that stuff in your hand and set yourself up for later. For sure. And you could also make a reputation for that too. So be careful. Very true. All right. The next topic of why you're losing is I'm losing because I'm getting too cocky or I'm going too fast. So this one is definitely applicable to me, I think, more than everyone else. Han Solo's words here echo deeply in our minds. Don't get cocky, kid. So going for the glory, I think, is my sort of fault. So I can smell the big play. The victory is in my hands. I've visioned it out in my head. I've been planning it for three turns now. And that is the exact moment that you're prone to make a really, really big mistake. It's sort of like the shiny object syndrome. I'm tunnel visioned in on something. Um, for instance, I tried to ultimate my Tevish Zot in the Commander Legends Game Nights, episode 40. And Josh is just sitting there with like a thousand rocks and ways to deal direct damage to a planeswalker. But I'm doing all this stuff because I've calculated in my head. I'm getting so cocky. It's going to be so cool when it happens that, of course, one flimsy little rock can disrupt my entire plans. And had I just stopped, looked around, assessed the table, and then started planning, I completely might have won that game and done something different. So that's just a great example of sort of going too fast or going for the glory, um, especially when you don't actually have it in your hand because of what's happening on the table. To the same degree, I think focusing too much on yourself and not looking at other parts of the table is a reason why that sort of episode happened. And pride can be one of the big downfalls when it comes to gaming or anything in life. So again, don't get tunnel vision. Every player has the potential to be a benefit to you too. If I'm playing the game solo and I don't think at some point, oh, maybe at some point I can team up with Craig to do something, I'm actually losing a lot of value because if something happens and Craig happens to be in the colors to deal with it, but I haven't made friends with him, then I'm actually losing out of a potentially life-saving partner in that situation. And it, you bring up something that goes back to an earlier point about the honey is better than salt. You know, honey is better than vinegar. If you buddy up with one of your, mm -hmm. you know, one of the other people at the table, you know, an, ex an example is like Game Nights Episode 1, where the second game, you know, I go to infect you. I go to detutor for something oh, yeah. and to Vinny. get you. And then Vinny ends up countering it to save you. And then you end up helping out Vinny later on in that game was a good example of like honey rather than vinegar. Yeah. And it definitely helped that I had a teammate when I needed it most and that sort of thing paid it forward down the line. Right. Yeah, don't be afraid to to ask for help in a commander game. We talked about this earlier in terms of like, what's on that card? I don't know how this combo works. What's the actual threat at the table? Players are always more than willing to help. I think that's like a big part of what commander makes commander so fun is that everyone can have that input and feel like they can sort of like help you out. And ultimately the ideal situation is when you get someone else to spend a card from their hand for you on a problem that, you know, Everyone shares, but maybe you're hurting the most from. Um, and finally, you know, don't go too fast because games of Commander, especially in more casual play groups, even really serious and competitive ones too, sometimes the games go for 15 plus turns. Yeah. And in that case, if you are just going off early and making a big threat and a big noise early in the game, you're really going to regret it because you're not going to be able to sustain that through the long game. And you're, you don't know if that game is going to go long or not, especially if you're making a mistake by going too fast and getting shut down or getting put so far behind that you have to spend the rest of that time catching up. Life is a resource, all right? And also, a big thing, I think a lot of people don't realize this, but when an arch enemy is done being the arch enemy, you don't need to treat them as the arch enemy anymore. Maybe they can come back at some point. Uh, I think a good example of this is the episode that I mind slaver Josh and the Moz went on to sort of value out and take out the game. At a certain point, I should have switched my intention entirely from Josh to a Moz, but I was so hyper focused on getting rid of Josh because I thought he was the arch enemy there that I let another player take that throne. And then I'd exhausted my resources and he had continued to just sort of take over the game from there too. And even further on that point, you know, what we were talking about how, you know, you can 
be arch enemy and then that can turn you into arch enemy for the next game Mm -hmm. you know uh that's just part of human nature like if you're going off this game and you turn into a monster and you kill everybody (laughs) in a a crazy way you know it's likely that next game they're going to be like hey jimmy uh remember how he just did that thing maybe uh hit him first yeah you know and that can definitely turn into a thing yeah it can especially if that person hitting you first is doing so with infect (laughs) all right the final category we're going to talk about today of why you're losing is sort of the most, I think, to me, the least significant, but it does make a big difference. I'm losing because I need to play better cards or more win conditions or build a stronger deck. It seems like the most obvious of all the categories, so it bears mentioning, and sometimes it just does come down to card selection. A deck that's playing way too many 8 CMC spells is going to lose to a deck that has got a better mana curve, just flat right. out. And there's obviously ways to mitigate this, so... Let's get through this. Craig, you wrote down some of these combos. Uh, these are ways for you to make sure you stop losing games. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is, I think some people, you know, are always looking for this, like, okay, so I'm losing games. What can I actually play to, to increase to win my win, con- win percentage? And combos are just a tried and true way of doing that. Yep. You know, combos are, you know, most CEDH are playing some sort of combo. You know, one way to win more is by you know, improving your consistency and which can get repetitive. Now, one thing to know is that by playing combos, you can have very repetitive play styles that Mm -hmm. can lead to you winning in the same way over and over, which can get boring. So, you know, that's something to consider whether you're talking about, you know, is my deck built to win versus am I, is my deck built to have fun? Yeah. Um, But I think combos are definitely a way to kind of increase your win percentage. And those can range from, you know, inexpensive stuff like Bergy and Grinning Ignis to like Micaeus Triskelion or, you know, more expensive combos that, Mm -hmm. you know, that work within different play styles and different types of decks. Yep. And you can also just play more tutors. You don't have to play Demonic Tutor every single time. There are lots of different things out there. You got your Wishclaw Talismans now these days that allow you to get that consistent nature of your deck that maybe gets you to your win cons more often. And there's also stuff like life gain. People often overlook the fact that life gain means that maybe you're the last person to get eliminated at the table, which means you have the most time now to build up your board and create that winning state so that once your other opponents have exhausted themselves trying to kill you because you have so much life, you can take them and defeat them. Rawr. Unless you're playing Infect. Unless you're playing Infect, yeah. So don't forget, you know, there's lots of ways to improve your deck that are manageable, not super expensive. Um, It could just be building in a combo. It could be saying, I need more synergy. Or it could just be, I need more win conditions. And I need ways to find those win conditions, and that'll help you lose a little bit less. Yep. Okay. That's going to wrap it up for why do I keep losing commander games. But first, we need to ask you, the listeners, very importantly, what have you done to lose less? Or what have you done to lose more? Are you on the losing streak right now? Is there anything that we missed in terms of how to break it? Are there ways around this that let you sort of understand how to better win the game and not lose so much? Are you the type of person that cares about winning? And if you do, why? If you don't, why? Let us yeah, know. I'd love to see stories of how, if you guys have had an issue with it and then how you solved it. Yeah. And of course, make sure you check out channelfireball.com slash command. That's the place to get all of your magic cards, single sealed products, and more. They have an amazing marketplace with competitive prices, and you're supporting local game stores the entire time when you're shopping from them. And that alpha and, box break. And that alpha box break for Ooh, those of you that are spicy. interested. It's going to be very spicy. Can't wait to see what comes out of that. And of course, big thanks to Ultra Pro, as always, for sponsoring the show. We love Ultra Pro products here on the show. We have playmats in front of us all the time. I have them at my house as my mouse pads. We use them everywhere. So you should too, especially if you want that official magic art printed in all its beautiful glory on there to make your whole sort of battlefield completely synced up. All right. Do you have an end set for us today, Craig, where we talk about something cool outside the world of magic? Uh, yeah, I've got some interesting news. So uh, we are going to have a girl. Oh, congratulations, yeah, appreciate Craig. appreciate it. You're going to have a baby. And a boy. And a baby boy. <laughs> Two so, babies. So yeah, so we're going to have twins and uh wow. you know, I just want to take a second like to talk about IVF, you know, I don't know if any of you guys have ever been through that with uh, your you significant explain others. The, what IVF stands for? Yeah, absolutely. So it's in vitro fertilization. It's basically, you know, uh if you're having an issue having babies concepting uh, concepting exactly you can uh, go to these specialists and they will help you 
make a baby basically. And yep. so, you know, we've been through it for a while. I've been doing it for, you know, uh, a few years now. So if You've anybody's trying for a few years, right? exactly. Yeah, yeah. And if, you know, if any of our, our listeners are going through that or considering it or been through it in the past, you know, I'd love to talk about it. So, you know, feel free to DM me or whatever. Um, I'm always open to that kind of stuff. Um, it can be frustrating, uh, yes. but, uh, has incredible payoffs as, I'm, you know, very now, happy yeah, now. So to it's going to be a, Look at you go. Yeah, great holiday season, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, it can, it can be tough. So if anybody ever wants to talk about it, feel free to hit me up. I'd love to talk to you about it. That's awesome. Yeah. Conception is one of those things that I think a lot of people struggle with. And it's one of those things that doesn't get talked about very much either. Yeah. So there are obviously lots of different, um, ways, uh, to sort of go about it, to find answers and solutions, some of them more accessible than others. But Craig is offering himself up as a resource. So even if you have any questions, you can definitely find him. Where are you on Twitter, Craig? At Craig Blanchett on Twitter and at Mr. Infect on uh, Instagram. Yes, but no infect involved with these babies. No these infect babies involved with these babies, no. but that's yeah. out of reach. Right? <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for sharing that, Craig. And congratulations once Appreciate again. Appreciate it. Yeah, we're excited. And a big thanks to everyone here at the Command Zone. A big shout out to our growing team uh, during the holiday season. So we have Arthur Mello. Croft, Lady Danger, Manson Lung, Craig Blanchett, Ashlyn Rose, Josh Murphy, Jake Boss, Patrick Nan, Jordan Pridgen, Sam Waldo, Garav Galati, Chuck Ty, Jamie Block, Damon Lynn, Sean Gillis, and Evan Limberger. Woo, what a team. It's a big team now. Big team. And big thanks as always is Jeffrey Palmer who does the Living Card animations that start our YouTube videos, sometimes behind us here on set. And you can find him at Living Cards MTG on Twitter. All right, everyone, we hope you get out there and you start winning more games and winning at life as well. We'll see you next time for more Command Zone. Peace. Peace. For further inquiries, send an email to commandcast at rocketjump.com or ask us on Twitter at JF Wong and at Josh Lee Kwai. See you later, alligator. Greetings, humans. <laughs> <laughs>